Coming up, a sudden stroke sends a family to their knees to pray, and a woman wakes up in the hospital with her hands and feet amputated. Well, welcome to 700 Club Canada. Bill, we're talking about a very important question today. Okay. Will God come through for me? Hmm. Yeah, it's funny, isn't it? It's really easy to believe that he can come through for somebody else. Yeah, exactly. But maybe not for me. And I actually think it's rooted in an essential element of being human, trust. Right. I think a lot of us have a hard time trusting, either yeah. because trust been, has been violated with us, or we don't feel like God's come through the way that we wanted him to. And so we have a hard time trusting God. That's true. We've had disappointment, right? Yeah, disappointment. And bottom line, we only trust people that we're in relationship with. That is so true. Got to be in relationship and with proven. God. And proven. And proven. That's right. Very, that's a good thought. Hold on to that. More to come. A stroke sends Lido fighting for his life as his family prays for a miracle. Watch this. Even if my husband wasn't able to talk again, wasn't able to walk again, we were still going to trust God. April 11, 2018 started out a typical day for Stacy Garcia. As a phlebotomist, she was working on site at a blood drive when she got a frantic message from her daughter, Emily. Stacy's husband, Lito, who suffered from chronic migraines, was in the ER. His entire left side was paralyzed. He couldn't move it. Stacy called her mom to pick her up from work, and they rushed to St. Anthony's Hospital in Lakewood, Colorado, over an hour away. While her mom drove, Stacy contacted family, friends, and their church, asking for prayer. We were praying all the way to the hospital. I was very frustrated because I wasn't there and I couldn't help my children take care of their dad. Lito's family and friends gathered at the hospital while doctors ran tests to find the cause of his paralysis. He was taken to the ICU and kept under observation. They did not have any answers at that time. They were giving him medications and putting him on any type of medication that was gonna help him. Stacy was relieved to see Lito alert and full of confidence. He was just telling me, you know, you need to just stay strong. Um, God has this. We're going to be okay. And we're going to get through this. I said goodnight to him and that I loved him and I wasn't leaving, um, but I would see him in the morning. Then later that night, Lito began having seizures, so doctors ordered another MRI. By the next morning... He had slipped into a coma. He wasn't waking up. And at that moment... I knew I had to go tell my family. I just took a deep breath and I said, God, I know you're doing something. I don't know what it is, but I'm still going to trust you. The MRI revealed that a blood clot had traveled to Lito's brain and ruptured, causing his brain to swell. His doctor performed an emergency procedure to remove the clot and also put him on a ventilator. He wasn't sure Lito would ever fully recover and the crisis wasn't over. The doctor had told me there was several different clots that were still in the brain that they needed to have um, broken up before they could safely wake him up. He could not guarantee that he was going to walk again. He could not guarantee that he was going to talk again. And most of my prayers were, God, I know that you're doing something. I don't know what you're doing. I, I just have to trust you. All Lito's family and friends could do was wait. A couple of days later, they had a prayer service at the hospital. All of us were in the waiting room, and we were all just worshiping God. At that moment, you could, you could just feel that God was there. My husband's nurse came, and she said, you don't understand. On the cardiology side, the cardiac patients are stabilizing. In the neurology side, we have people that were in comas before, and they're waking up. We had somebody come in last night, and he was uh, in a motorcycle accident, broken bones. They didn't expect him to live. He woke up, and he wants food. Yet Lito was still in a coma. His family continued to pray for his complete recovery, and he slowly began to improve. Four days later, Lito woke up. I asked him, do you remember me? My heart kind of sank a little bit because he's just stared at me. And the look on his face that he gave me, I couldn't tell if he was trying to process what I asked him or if he did not remember me. Lito was still intubated, so Stacy wasn't sure about his brain function. Then, 
A couple of days later... He actually wrote that his mom and I needed to remember that as long as he has breath in his lungs, God can do the impossible. It gave me so much hope, so much more happiness to know that he was going to be okay. The next day, the vent was removed. Lito was able to talk. He still was paralyzed on his left side, so his family continued to pray. Lito began gaining new ground each day, and a couple of weeks later... I would look at my foot, the one side that wasn't working, and I would just look at it and I would say, move, move, and it, it, and it was a jerk. It would just go back and forth. And then before long, I was telling him I need a bend. He would say, babe, guess what? <laughs> and he would pull his knee up, <laughs> and he would move his knee. Those little tiny things that he was doing daily were <laughs> so exciting. All the time, he was doing something different. After just over three weeks in the hospital, Lito was able to walk out on his own. He and his family have no doubt his healing was a result of prayer. I'm here by the power of God and the product of prayer. And I tell individuals, I'm here because you prayed. Prayer is a, a powerful thing. We're not fighting against flesh and blood, but we're fighting a spiritual battle. And we're fighting against something that we can't see. Prayer is the best way for us to get through those things. Now Lito is back at work and enjoying the things he loves to do with his family. God made it happen. I didn't know if my husband was ever gonna wake up again to now being able to enjoy a motorcycle ride and being able to continue to share life together. As long as you have, you have breath in your lungs, he can do the impossible. Stacy's right. Prayer is a powerful thing. And we're not fighting against flesh and blood, but we are fighting a spiritual battle. But maybe you're wondering, like, what does that even mean? Well, the Bible clearly indicates that there is a spiritual realm. Yeah, we can't see it, but it is just as real as what you can see. Well, so you say, well, how do you know it exists? Well, I think there's a few reasons. One, our own experience. There are simply things that we can't explain. There are things that happen to us, things that we feel intuitively that we know cannot be explained in the natural world. We have a sense that there's something more. But we also have the Bible. And the Bible tells us clearly of this heavenly battle um, between good and evil, God and Satan. But then, of course, for me, Jesus is the greatest proof of this. He demonstrated the spiritual realm in his life, in his death, and in his resurrection. So maybe you're thinking, well, why does it even matter that there's a spiritual realm? I'll tell you why. Because when you understand it, it brings great clarity. It gives you a greater understanding of the way the world is and why things are the way that they are. And it also gives you direction. You can learn through prayer to trust God's voice, to get access to this other reality that is greater than the reality that you are limited by on this world. And finally, it gives you power. Here's the coolest part. Did you know? that you can actually have access to the God who is in control of everything. That's incredibly powerful. And so maybe you're curious about the supernatural realm. I wanna invite you to call us at 1-855-759-0700, talk to one of our prayer counselors, and we also have this great resource called Secrets to the Supernatural because there is something more and it's available for you. You can learn to lean into the power of prayer and see things changed. That is true. Well now, a family clings to hope that a miracle is on its way. Watch this. I was terrified. The thought of her dying in an hour's time is uh, something to be concerned about. Tanya Morrison and her husband Paul have been attending church with her parents, Dwayne and Kay, for years. That Sunday, their pastor had an unusual and ominous message for Tanya. And suddenly the Spirit gave me Tanya's name and said to Tanya, that the Lord was holding her in the palm of his hand. She was going to face some problems uh, in her life that she really wasn't even aware of. We just couldn't imagine what it was gonna be, and we did not know that within 24 hours that this would happen. When I heard what Brother Walter said, I thought it was an amazing blessing for Tanya. I certainly didn't think it was anything to do with a medical condition that she had. In 2017, Tanya was diagnosed with diabetes insipidus, an uncommon disorder that causes an imbalance of fluids in the body. 
The day after receiving the message from her pastor, Tanya woke up not feeling well. Her doctor was concerned about some recent lab results and insisted Tanya get another test. Then, on her way home, she became very ill and could barely move. Her doctor called with urgent news. I heard the urgency in her voice. She said, Daddy, I need your help real badly. I, the doctor just told me I have water poisoning that uh, I need to get to the Murfreesboro Hospital within an hour. It is a matter of life and death. I remember her using those terms, matter of life and death. Tanya's father, Dwayne, who lives nearby, swung into action and raced her to the Murfreesboro Hospital to get her there before it was too late. I would look in the rear view mirror and see my daughter basically unconscious, and uh, I was praying for her, and I'd say, Lord, I know you've got her in the palm of your hand, and one of my favorite scriptures that was coming to me, he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And uh, we knew that the Almighty had our daughter in his hand. They made an hour-long drive in just 25 minutes, and when they got off the highway, they hit seven green lights in a row before arriving at the hospital. They pulled up to the emergency room. Uh, I opened the back door. She was unresponsive in the back seat. It was completely scary to see her, just unconscious. Doctors determined that due to her diabetes, Tanya's sodium had dropped to a life-threatening 112, causing her brain to swell and lose consciousness. Nobody else had ever left the hospital with her condition alive, is what they told us. So we were, you know, really praying for her. You know, just praying for the Lord to take care of her, to bring her back to us, and we were not ready to lose her. We were depending on the power of prayer and knew that we were asking for a miracle, and we knew we had a lot of praying people that uh, could pray and that the Lord could answer prayer and that he had all power and that he was going to keep her in the palm of his hand and perform that miracle. We needed one. I immediately thought back to the, the words that Brother Walter had spoken over Sunday, and I, so I, I felt comfortable. I, I knew that she was in God's hands and nothing could, could really be bad, but I was concerned. Over the next three days in the hospital, Tanya's sodium levels came back to a safe range, and she began her recovery. When I came to, I knew beyond a shadow of a doubt it was the hand of the Lord and that he'd spared my life and that that was what Brother Walter, when he had that word of knowledge the day before, I knew exactly that's what it meant and that God had spared my life. He came through for us that time in such a magnificent way, and we are so thankful that the Lord demonstrated his power by saving our daughter. It was wonderful seeing her, knowing that she was still alive. and that, I mean, she was a miracle. She was a miracle. I think one of her favorite songs is, uh, I can't even walk without you holding my hand, referring to the hand of the Lord. And Paul, her husband, had her one hand and the Lord had her other hand. I'm thankful that God carried us through that and that he gave me a life with Tanya. Tanya remains thankful for God's encouraging word that provided a source of hope during a terrible situation. It's hard to describe the gratitude and the love you feel and just knowing the love he has for you, that he did this, he spared your life for a reason. And now he has your life, you know, in his hand, and he had me in the palm of his hand. It's just a miracle because you, when you watch how it played out, and that the day before, in 24 hours from the time that was spoken by my pastor, I was in the back seat of that car hanging on to life, and how he can turn that around and heal you, and it brings glory to him, and that's what's, you know, important. You know, it was all for his glory. He had a plan, and it was all for his glory. That's a powerful story, Bill. Yeah. And it just reminds me that often we're facing something that we need to actually hear a word from God. Yes. Like, what do you want to say to me about this, yes. right? Have you experienced like, just, well, I know you have, how God speaks to you? Yeah, well, I remember, I got a great story. When I was younger, I didn't know what that looked like or felt like. And so I really wanted to know what that was like. So we were at this conference and the preacher that night was talking about this. And he said, God will speak to you if you ask. So I remember uh, praying and saying, God, please, I want to I want to know it's your voice. I want to hear you. And I really felt that God said this. It was my first time ever kind of leaning into this. Yeah. Said green. And I'm like, that's it? Oh, okay, that, just green. I know, I know, great. It's, it, gets, it gets great. So <laughs> I went up to this preacher and I said, yeah, I feel like God said something to me. And I, and I said, uh, green, does that mean anything to you? And he looked at me and he's like, 
N not really. <laughs> and I remember going back and thinking, oh, I missed it. And I was so frustrated. But then God said, literally, I heard it. Yeah. Now that I know I can trust you with what I'm going to tell you, he gave me something for someone in that room, and it was spot on what they needed to hear. And that was really the beginning of a journey of learning to trust. We talked about that at the beginning, trusting God's voice. And here's how you know, it will never contradict God's word, yeah. but it'll always make you who you were created to be. Yeah, to totally true. And I think in all of that, I love that because God loves to speak to us. Yes. But he speaks to us for the purpose of us obeying what he said. Absolutely. Right? Like if we're not willing to actually believe that that was God and take the step of action, trust the word. Right. Why does he need to speak to us? Well, communication is much more than words, mm -hmm. right? It's intent and tone and understanding. Like, yeah. like when you're married, you learn just because someone is saying something doesn't mean that's exactly what it's about. So learning to, to know God's nature and yeah. character is actually more important sometimes than hearing the actual words. So true. Uh, there's a great scripture verse that I want to share with you. Lamentations chapter 3, verses 57 and 58. Here's what it says. You came near when I called you and you said, do not fear. You, Lord, took up my case. You redeemed my life. I love that because it promises God will come near That's when we right. call him. He loves to speak to us. That's right. Hope that encourages you today. In my world, I went to sleep one night and I'd been holding my three month old baby and sending my five year old girl off to school. And I awoke the next day, but it had been five weeks and I'd been in a coma. And I looked up and Mark was standing over me and he had this very intense look of love in his eyes. And he said, honey, you've been very ill and they've had to amputate your hands and feet. Mark and Cindy lived the typical life. Both were driven in their careers until ultimately deciding to settle down and start a family. But not long after the arrival of their second child, Cindy suddenly fell ill. In February of 2011, I was a wife and a mom and a business manager. I was on maternity leave and my son had the croup, so I would take him back and forth to the hospital. And after the last visit, I spiked a fever. I had a strange ache in my right leg and I started vomiting. That became more aggressive and I became more and more ill. There was two different uh, 911 calls. The first crew came and said, oh, your wife has a bad flu and she needs to take some medicine and rest. And the next day we realized that this was an irregular flu. We called 911 again and they came and then they rushed her to uh, emergency. Ensuring the kids were all right, Mark raced to the hospital, unaware that his wife was in a fight for her life. On my way there, my cell phone rang. It was the hospital calling. I was a nurse and uh, she said, uh, do you realize how serious this is? Like, uh, my wife's ill, I understand. Well, we need to hear right away. You need to make some decisions. I get to the hospital that night. Lots of doctors around Cindy. I had to sign off on them putting Cindy in a coma so she could uh, fight this bacterial infection. They didn't know it was flesh eating disease at that point. Then they induced Cindy in a coma, put her up into uh, ICU. They diagnosed me with necrotizing fasciitis. Eventually, my kidneys, liver, heart, and respiratory system failed. And my hands and feet went from blue to purple to black. And they started dying, shriveling. Every day, I was at the hospital, and the same head doctor would tell me, I don't think your wife's going to make it. Every day. Came home one night around 11 p.m. We had lots of friends, family helping us out with the kids. They're at our house. And uh, one of my friends pulled me aside and said, uh, Mark, you know, we've been talking and you know, just take a look at Cindy. We don't know what's going on with her hands and feet. They're black, they're shriveled, that flesh eating disease eating away at her leg. Doctors say she probably has brain damage. What kind of life is she going to have? And you may want to think about pulling that plug. And she may not want to even live. The weight of this reality was almost too much for Mark to bear. He drove back to the hospital to be with his dying wife. The nurses let me in. I said, I need to pray with my wife. And I said my first real honest prayer to the Lord on my knees beside Cindy's bed. I said, God, I need to know if Cindy wants to live, if she wants to die, if I need to pull the plug. I, I don't know what to do here. It's, it, it's not my decision to make. A desperate Mark searched for an answer to his prayers. 
and a few short days later, God delivered it in a way that left no doubt. It was my mother-in-law, and she left me a voicemail. She said, Mark, I don't know how to say this, but I'm supposed to give you a message. I've been hearing voices, and, and it sounds like angels singing all morning, saying, Cindy wants to live. She needs more time. Don't pull the plug. To me, this was the evidence I needed. Like, God was in control, and it's like, this burden about Cindy's illness and everything going on I just left. It was like it just washed away. I knew she was going to live. I knew he was real. I knew he was in control. And I went upstairs to the ICU and I, I, I walked into that uh, doctor that kept telling me every day that she's going to die. <laughs> and before he could say anything, I said, you know what? She's going to live. You see, you'll see. I know she's going to live. God told me so. Cindy began to stabilize but the damage to her hands and feet were irreversible. That left Mark with another difficult decision. I had a call from the doctor at about 11.30 at night. We need you to make a decision and to sign off the paperwork. Uh, we're gonna have to amputate all four of Cindy's limbs. When I woke up from the coma and Mark told me that I had lost my hands and feet, I couldn't believe it. And my first thoughts were of my children. How would I take care of them? And how could I do anything for myself? And really cried out to God, why would you do this to me? And a nurse walked in and read me Psalm 139. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. And it goes on to talk about how we are created at the beginning of time, and that God created me with great love and great hope for my future. And I just, in that moment, knew that he would be the one who would carry me through. And we have an opportunity to, to allow him to carry it for us. I knew that God was all powerful. I had been told that since I was a child but I didn't know how I was going to overcome it. As I lay in the coma, I felt the whispering in my heart that I needed to write this story. And I felt the whispering in my heart that I would be able to shine his light. We found great purpose in all of this. It wasn't our purpose. It was his purpose. It was really horrible what happened. We endured much pain and suffering. And sometimes we don't know in trial, why is this happening to us? Why, why do I have to endure this? And certainly our trials didn't end there. But God had a purpose. He came in and carried us through. And Shine On is a reflection of that light that we are all called to shine for him. Hi, I'm Ezra Maland, and on behalf of the Scott Mission, I'd like to say a personal thank you for partnering with 700 Club Canada. Because of our work together, we are reaching families and individuals with the gospel and supporting many with meals, shelter, clothing, and groceries. So thank you, partners, and God bless you. 
isn't it beautiful to see how God works his will and his ways out in people's lives through incredible stories and through the work of Scott Mission. And you can be a part of it. If you become a partner with 700 Club Canada, start at $20 a month. We make it really easy to give by using Pledge Express. It's an automatic monthly withdrawal saving on min fees and ultimately putting money in the hands of those who need it most. So why don't you partner with us as a thank you gift for becoming a monthly partner or receive our latest CD, Putting on the Armor of God. Simply call us today, one 855 759 0700 and let's get this message of hope and truth across our nation and around the world from generation to generation we pass on our knowledge our values and our strength in the brand new audio recording putting on the armor of god pat robertson reads the book of ephesians be kind and compassionate to one another forgiving each other just as in christ god forgave you Discover the knowledge, values, and strength of the kingdom of God to pass along to the next generation. Available now. Bill, I just love this reminder today that not only does God love to speak to us, like if we listen to God, it is going to be the truth. I, I do love that, especially in a world of conflicting noises. It's like there's a lot of noise right now with media, with neighbors, friends, your own voices in your head. There's so many noises and it can be really distracting and frustrating. And to have that clarity that God is speaking to you, come on, that's amazing. One who sees everything. Right. Where do you find that you can hear God's voice more clearly? <clears throat> yeah, well, for me, it's actually I have to get in a very quiet place. I have to push out all the noises. It is a discipline. Yeah. Usually I have to get up really early um, because there's not a lot happening yet. My phone isn't ringing at me. People aren't asking me for things. I don't have my own expectations. I can just sit and be still. Be still and know yeah. that I am God, the Bible says. Me too. I love my lake at my cottage. <laughs> yeah. I just find that there's something about being on water right. or in nature for me, going for a walk just gives me the clarity and, and you know what prayer is the conduit it's this, it's this sort of ongoing conversation with God so we want to pray Desiree said please pray for me I'm a single mom of five children I just found out I have kidney disease wow. I'm so sorry and we will pray for you yeah and Ingrid said please pray that I would find a good remote job and, and as we're praying today I want you actually to engage with us I actually want you just to whatever you're doing right now maybe just stop for just a second and pause and let God speak to you as we pray. And so God, I do pray for Desiree, this uh, terrible diagnosis, but God, I know that you're the healer. I know that you are greater. I know she has a lot of fears and concerns, but I pray that you would speak into her situation and she would hear you clearly today. You are victorious in her life. Yeah, Jesus, pray for Ingrid. Please help her find a good job, a remote job that would uh, just really help provide in her life. Yes. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you so much for watching. Have an amazing day. Know God wants to speak to you right now. To contact us, visit 700club.ca. Tomorrow on the 700 Club Canada, a woman challenges God to prove that he is real and a prison inmate prays to end the continuous cycle of drug abuse.